It's my pleasure to be meeting with Zubin Bilimoria, a very, very diverse chartered accountant with experience in multiple fields. Uh, he is a practicing chartered accountant. He is a technical reviewer for the Quality Review Board of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. He is an independent director and he is also the treasurer to the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. He will also be shortly taking on as a secretary to the Technical Advisory Board being formed by True and Fire Professionals Network. Zubin, thank you for your time. Pleasure meeting with you. Zubin, uh, True and Fire Professionals Network, it is participating in the World Congress of Accountants event being held in Mumbai in November 22. And in this connection, we want to talk to multiple child accountants to seek their views about certain matters about audit and that is the context in which this session is happening. Uh, the first question I have of you is, you know, there is an expectation gap with the regulators, not just in India, internationally also. While some, some can say that the regulators, there is an overreach in terms of the inspection process, I think there is also a need for the audit profession to scale up and respond to the regulatory expectations. What are your views on it and what would you suggest to the audit firms to do in this context? First of all, thank you very much for giving this opportunity. I think the concept of an expectation gap is a very common thing now, which is basically engaging the audit profession. See, earlier audit, it was always said that we were expected to give an opinion on the true and fair view of the financial statements, since the responsibility for the preparation of the financial statements lies with the management. But maybe there is a perception that with the advancement of technology and greater digitization, the auditors have now are in a better position to access more data and accordingly the corresponding expectations also have increased. There are a couple of things which are relevant here. One is the first is the expectation gap vis-a-vis -vis whether we are required to concentrate on frauds, report on frauds and what is our role and responsibilities on that. That is the first expectation gap. The second expectation gap is whether the opinion which we are giving as true and fair, whether that is to the satisfaction of all the stakeholders. Because I remember during one panel discussion where I was the panelist with one of the managing directors of a company who also happened to be a chartered accountant. He was very categorical that now the concept of giving a true and fair opinion is outdated and it, the expectation is that the auditors have to more veer towards a true and correct opinion. Maybe the right attitude to that is that we have to strike some sort of a balance from a reasonable assurance to a more higher level of assurance, more higher degree of assurance. So that is where we have to move out to. It would be difficult in my view to meet the expectation of a true and correct opinion by the auditors. True and correct will never be, never possible, be possible because we will have the inherent limitation of materiality. Yes. We will have the inherent limitation of management or of controls yes. which the auditors may not be able to detect yes. even if they perform the proper yes. Uh, audit. Yes. You raise the issue of fraud, yes. expectation gap on fraud. Now, what should the auditors be doing for that expectation gap? Let, do they let it remain and then face all the criticism? Or can they do something more to minimize some of the criticism? No, so definitely steps can be taken to minimize the expectation gap. And one of the fundamental things for that is adopting an attitude of professional skepticism. Because that is something which was always there. Never accept anything at face value. Always be alert, especially if you have been auditing a client for too long, you have to avoid getting into the trap of a familiarity. familiarity. Because as they say, familiarity breeds contempt. So we need to ensure that we don't get caught in that trap. So to that extent, our role in identifying and unhurting frauds remains important. And as I mentioned earlier, with greater digitization, with more digital technology like artificial intelligence and robotic 
tools also available though I'm not really much of an expert on that but definitely we can combine our professional skepticism skill sets with the digital skill sets which the current younger generation is more familiar, familiar with so that way I think we can definitely play a much better role now in trying to unearth the frauds than maybe say compared to even five or ten years back so that is also again as I said an interrelationship with the expectation gap so we should be definitely able to bridge the expectation gap to some extent because of the technology which we have at our disposal very true Zubin I think Technology should be leveraged to minimize some of these expectation gaps. Very, very true. Zubin, my next question, I'm jumping topic slightly. My next question is the importance and relevance of system of quality control. Because when I've been meeting with CA firms, many CA firms argue with me. I don't want to say right or wrong. Uh, in a way, it is wrong. Uh, they argue with me that so long as I perform my engagement properly, I don't need to formally have a structured SQC because if my engagement is performed properly, that means somewhere inherently the SQC is working. So that is the contention which is there. Whereas in my view, engagement performance is one of the components of SQC amongst the five components of SQC. And therefore each of them has an importance. For example, SQC has concept of independence ethics. It has got the concept of human resources. It is talking about monitoring. It is talking about the leadership effectiveness, etc. Now, how does view, one view SQC vis-a-vis -vis engagement performance? See, SQC, in my view, has to be looked at from two perspectives. One is SQC as far as an engagement level SQC is concerned. That is something, according to me, which is important irrespective of the size of the firm and irrespective of the type of audit which you are doing. Because the basic quality the documentation, the compliance with the auditing standards, an element of professional skepticism, all that has to be maintained. The documentation has to be robust. Of course, the degree of robustness would depend upon the size, complexity and the risk okay. profile of the engagement. But that as far as SQC is concerned, we have to follow with all those requirements which are laid down in the auditing standards. The other is basically the SQC at the firm level. Now at the firm level, some of the requirements which are laid down in the SQC would be more relevant for the larger size firms and for the small and medium enterprises. It may be a little difficult and may not be even practical for them to comply with all the requirements. So that is where the differentiation has to be there. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that even the smaller firms have to entirely ignore SQC and compliance with SQC because the regulators, and that includes NAFRA about which you had also mentioned earlier, is also now laying more emphasis on the firm level policies. See, even within the SQC policies, Independence is non-negotiable. Maybe in terms of leadership responsibilities or in terms of HR policies, there could be different degrees of implementation depending upon the size of the firms. Compliance with the code of conduct and ethics, again, is something which is non-negotiable irrespective of the size of the firm. It has to be adhered to whether you have two partners or whether you have 20 partners or even for LLPs now an unlimited number of partners. Yeah. So that is how I look at SQC. The overriding thing is that you should be able to demonstrate through your documentation whether you have done a good audit. Yeah. Because what is otherwise, I remember an idiom, what is not documented is not done. Is not done. That is the long and short of it. Yeah. So Zubin, when you are talking about SQC on engagements, you are talking about compliance with standards and auditing as essential. Now, standards and auditing is a broad principle-based guideline which has been given. 
Now we have got a divergent set of companies, entities which goes through the audit, a large company to a very very small company. Now how will I apply the same standards and auditing for both the large and the small company? It becomes very very challenging in terms of applying such standards and auditing to a small company. And we don't have separate standards yet announced for small and medium sized companies. So how does one practically go about compliance with standards and auditing? And how do you look at this as a technical reviewer when you do a QR review? I mean, while there may be no separate standards for small and medium enterprises, there are quite a few of the standards on auditing, which basically have consider specific considerations for the smaller entities. So that can serve as a basic guide. Maybe all the requirements of all the auditing standards may not be applicable to them because there is guidance in individual standards dealing with specific aspects which have to be concentrated upon by the smaller entities. So that can serve as a basis. Internationally, I understand also we currently don't have a separate set of auditing standards, though there are talks that a separate framework for the small enterprises is under consideration. Yeah, yes, it come out with the exposure, exposure draft. draft, yes. So I am sure we will also ultimately always follow the IASB because all our auditing standards are also virtually aligned to the IASB. So I am sure over the course of the next few years, we will have separate set of standards. But pending the formulation of separate standards, we have to definitely try and be as practical as possible. And that is where maybe I feel that currently the firms are at a disadvantage as far as the uh, auditing standards are concerned because they probably do not have the wherewithal. Yeah. yeah. And then there definitely needs to be a lot more awareness about the auditing standards. I always refer to the auditing standards as like the neglected cousin brother of the accounting standards. Yeah. Whereas people may be able to rattle off the accounting standards numbers, they may not all be very familiar with the auditing standards. standards. Yeah. So yeah. there definitely has to be more awareness, more training programs also which have to be focused on the auditing standards rather than on the accounting standards because the regulators which includes NAFRA are also now focusing more on the auditing standards rather than too much on the accounting standards. Yeah. So one of the feedback I got in my first question, regulatory gap expectation, was that many chartered accountants actually went back and said that auditors have to go back to the drawing board. They should start reading the auditing standards and start doing the work rather than taking the auditing standards for granted because that will suddenly get them to realize that they are missing out on basic things which are stated on the standards which is what the regulator is picking up in their inspections. So they are saying that go back to the drawing board and start from scratch, you will get it right is what they are telling. I think you are making think the same absolutely. point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. think it is important that an emphasis has to be there by our professionals yeah. and especially the small and medium enterprises. Yeah. So, so the next question I have is, is sort of an interlinked question. One is on size and scale of the audit firms and second is the potential of a joint audit becoming mandatory in India. Now there is a talk that joint audit will become mandatory in India and uh, if I look at from the company side, they may be not, not in favor of joint audit but if it does come through, they are worried in terms of which is the auditor they will appoint jointly with their current auditor because the current auditor will be a large firm and they are saying that I need to have a similar size firm coming in as a joint auditor then only there will be compatibility. Otherwise, it becomes an education turning training ground in my audits. I don't want to be a learning ground. I don't want experienced people to come and do my audit. So the related question therefore is, how should CA firms prepare for such an opportunity? Second related question is, what do you think about the concept of networking and where do you think it stands in India? Because today, if I don't see much of big networks other than the large firms. The big four is there. Maybe other two, three networks are there which are large, but other than that, we don't see anything. And most of them are international networks. We don't have a domestic network uh, uh, coming in at all. And if you look at the NAFRA database, NAFRA is saying that about 7,000 companies are covered under NAFRA, and there are close to 4,000 auditors auditing those 7,000 companies. So it indicates a very, very fragmented practice, and a joint audit scenario is very worrisome for, for corporates and even the large firms because they will say that we are, we are not going to be working with compatible firms. So how do audit firms scale up and what should they be doing in this environment? I have raised a lot of valid points in the context of joint audit. 
and in the context of consolidation. I think one thing is now very clear that the smaller firms will increasingly find it difficult to survive and especially in the audit of public interest entities which would be under the scrutiny of NAFRA. So one of the alternatives is to go in for consolidation. The second alternative otherwise is that they have to rely on guidance and advice and consultation from their peers yeah. who can basically help them to comply with the quality requirements. And the third thing is the concept of joint audit looks like it is here to say. Now it is not something which is entirely new. The concept of joint audit is already there in our Insurance. companies act. Yeah. There are quite a few of the big business groups which have joint audits because of various reasons. There are certain cases in the recent past where the regulators have also mandated joint audit. The first classic example is that of insurance companies. Yeah. Right from the very beginning of the privatization of insurance companies, IRDA had mandated joint audits for them. Similarly, in about a year back, RBI there have been guidelines made by the RBI for mandatory joint audit of NBFCs above a certain size. So the regulations are moving towards it. And even so similarly for companies also, it is inevitable that joint audits will happen. See, there are advantages and disadvantages of joint audits. And I would say that there may be more disadvantages for the companies. Basically, they may arise because of the fact, as you mentioned earlier, that the size of the firm, both the firms may not be compatible. So the level of reliance between the firms per se will also be susceptible. More than size, you are referring to the capability. Capabilities and yeah. such. Yeah. So they may want the firm which perceives itself to be more superior. I'm saying perceives itself to be more superior would push for virtually a hundred percent audit. audit. And that is where it will create issues relationship issues with the clients. Yeah. To take care of these issues, it would not be a bad idea for the regulators itself to prescribe the operating modalities for conducting joint audits as part of the statute. There is a standard on auditing which deals with joint audits. That is very clear that the responsibilities have to be divided based on the understanding which they enter into between themselves. But other than that, that of course does not prevent the case where I mentioned where a perceived superior auditor, yeah, they want, to, they want yeah. to review the work of the other. So that is where maybe some sort of operational guidelines, safeguards and regulations need to be laid down. So that is something which seriously the regulators need to consider. Mm -hmm. So even when the regulator is pushing for joint audits, when NAFRA is pushing for joint audits, what they need to do is lay down a set of guidelines. Okay. That would probably help everybody and bring in greater clarity and also probably help the companies also. I mean, the views of both the sides have to be taken, the companies yeah. also, as well as of the audit okay. firms of differing sizes. Yeah. Any views on networking, Zubin? See, networking guidelines are there. See, networking is maybe again a subset of the consolidation which I have talked about. Yeah. So basically, consolidation and networking are interrelated. There definitely needs to be. So, one of the ways of consolidation is networking. Networking. And there definitely yeah. needs to be more emphasis and rigor. And I can see it happening. Okay. That's if good. not on a formal basis, at least on an informal basis in terms of firms now relying more and more on their peers to help them guide, mm. help them to guide them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So, I mean, thank you for your time and thoughts. Uh, we at True and Fair yes. are already embarking on this journey of trying to set up some quality policies, standards, etc. Yes. which audit firms can follow. 
and we are trying to build in a lot of the thoughts which we are receiving in these interviews and discussions into our policies and you will get to see them as we develop those policies. Yeah. But thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank see you. a lot of potential for true and fair I think going forward. Yeah. So my best yeah. wishes to you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank Be beautiful. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.